past eight. Chat with uh, the uh, co-leader of the Greens, Russell Norman. It's been a, um, a few weeks joining us on public transport in Wellington City today. Good morning, Russell. Good morning, Memo. How are you? Good, good. You've been overseas? Uh, yeah, I was in Japan for a week. And uh, what, what were you doing over there? A bit of a fact-finding mission? Uh, yeah, it was a conference organised by the um, members of the um, Japanese House of Representatives about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Ah. Uh, so that was the primary purpose. I also went and had a look at Fukushima while I was up there. Because um, uh, you were there around the time of the anniversary, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I was, actually. The, um, there was, yeah, it was a big deal. So there was lots of anti-nuclear protests, actually, um, which was quite unusual uh, in Tokyo um, on, the, on the first year anniversary of Fukushima. How, how large were those protests? Uh, I'd say I had a guess several thousand, um, but they're kind of large by Japanese standards, um, and the, also they were kind of they were organised not by any of the kind of large uh, official groups. So it's a lot of NGOs, if you like. Um, so it was quite unusual. There's a very very strong anti-nuclear power feeling in Japan at the moment. Yeah, they're in a, a bit of a, a bind though, really, are they? Because um, they don't have a lot of alternatives when it comes to power, and they're very power hungry in Japan. Um, they are. I mean, there's 130 million people on a country a little bit larger than New Zealand, so um, there's a lot of pressure on them. But, I mean, you know, they, they've closed down 52 of the 54 nuclear reactors, and they still got through last summer, and they've got through the winter. Um, the, the challenge for them is to find alternative renewables, and they haven't explored geothermal much at all, um, whereas New Zealand has a lot of, you know, we've invested heavily in geothermal. We've got about 13% uh, generation from geothermal now. Yeah. And so they've got some good options there because they're on the, on, the, on the edge of the plate like we are. Uh, so uh, you went up to Fukushima. How close did you get to the epicentre of uh, the nuclear disaster there? Uh, well, there's a 20-kilometre exclusion zone where nobody's allowed in, and we got permission to go in there. And we got, I don't know, within about 10 kilometres of the, of the um, nuclear reactor. Were you nervous? No, no, we, we weren't in there for long. We had a Geiger counter with us the whole time. Um, it was probably, you know, 10 or 20 times a safe level of radiation if you were living there. Yeah. Um, but if you're just visiting for a few hours, it was okay. But, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's a huge area where it's completely empty of people. All the villages have been abandoned. All the fields are abandoned. Um, yeah, it's a very strange place to be in a, a nuclear fallout zone. I'd imagine pretty pretty spooky. I mean, do do you see any evidence of things being affected by radiation? No, not really. I mean, you only really know because of the your Geiger counter with you what the levels are. I mean, the main interesting or the kind of main thing there is they um, it was very heavily hit by the tsunami, mm. um, and so they haven't done as much clean up in the radiation zone as they have elsewhere, uh, just because of the difficulties of getting in and out. So there's a lot of cars all through and through the paddy fields and smashed up buildings everywhere, it's huge um, steel reinforced concrete buildings that are just smashed to pieces by the mm. tidal wave. Did you, uh, so did you get the feeling that um, the population was being given the correct information by the authorities and you know, do people trust what the authorities are saying? N- no, there's been, I mean, Japanese society, I guess, since the Second World War at least, but even before really, and um, there's there's kind of like a trust and authority, if you like, mm. um, and that is really broken down. It's one of the things that everybody there um, is remarking on, um, is that people don't believe what the government tells them anymore, and they certainly don't believe what the nuclear industry tells them, and that's quite different. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, in some ways it's, a good, it's good to be um, a little bit uh, sceptical of what governments and politicians tell you, um, so I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're also there for the uh, for, for talks about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Tell us about that. Um, so the, the TPP is a supposedly a trade agreement, but its main target is changing domestic law. Um, so, for example, in Japan, they want to change the law that governs health insurance. They have a universal, not-for-profit health insurance scheme which you pay into depending on what your income is. Um, and... So the U.S. finance industry is targeting that universal health care scheme because they want to make it more like the American system, which is a for-profit scheme where 60 million people don't have cover. Right. Um, and so it, it, the TPP is very focused on breaking domestic laws. In, in New Zealand, it's focused, for example, on getting rid of our labelling of GM foods. Um, it's, lay, it's targeting Farm Act to try to break Farm Act. Um, so the uh, so it's a very interesting debate is, you know, how much do we want to give over domestic law 
but that's what would be required to sign up to the TPP. Hmm. Uh, I mean, do you do you think that we should sign up to it at all? No, no. I mean, if you sign up to the TPP, then you're going to have to give over a lot of domestic law. It also means that if the government introduces legislation that um, foreign investors don't like, which is largely multinationals, um, then they can sue New Zealand government in an international tribunal, a three-person tribunal, um, basically three trade lawyers. And these are these um, investor state disputes mechanisms. And there's heaps of cases now um, where governments are being sued in, under these. I mean, the one that's mm. famous at the moment, of course, is Philip Morris is talking about suing Australia because Australia is introducing um, plain packaging for tobacco. Right. And Philip Morris says, well, if you do that, it'll cost us a lot of money, which is probably true. Um, and so they're saying you have to compensate us if you want to have plain packaging for tobacco. Oh. So the investor state disputes mechanisms are quite a critical part of these agreements. So, but we're told that the, the benefits to exporters will be enormous, though. Well, it's not at all clear that there is a huge gain to exporters in any of this. Um, you know, I mean, will, will the United States give anything on agriculture? Well, they certainly didn't give anything to the Australia when they did the Australia US FTA. Um, so I doubt that there's much in it for exporters. Mm. Russell Norman, co of the Greens, thanks very much for joining us today. Cheers, Alex.